Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910A on the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Tuesday, June 1st, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Well, the commemoration of the 100th uh, year, 100 years since the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, continues. It was 100 years ago today. We know there was a mob of about 15,000 white people who came into North Tulsa uh, early in the morning of June 1st, 1921, largely destroying a lot of the town. If we look at the book uh, by Hannibal B. Johnson, uh, Black Wall Street, from Ride to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District. He puts the number at, uh, it was about 15,000 who came through, who came in uh, on the morning of June 1st uh, at uh, somewhere around dawn. He talks about this uh, in his book in chapter one. I'll give you the exact page here in just a minute. So we saw that Joe Biden uh, was in Tulsa today for the commemoration. And uh, he, earlier today, um, you know, I did a, about an hour and 40 minute uh, broadcast. And uh, I talked about uh, what Biden was going to talk about and the agenda that Biden was uh, laying out today to address the racial wealth gap to address the racial wealth gap. So be sure to check that out uh, at our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. I did that broadcast earlier today. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, and some of the policies that Biden laid out. Uh, Page 46 of... Black Wall Street from Ride to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District by Hannibal B. Johnson. He says, by dawn, some 15,000 whites had amassed ready to strike at the heart of Tulsa's African-American community and strike they did. By 6 a.m., the the African-American community had, uh, had been invaded wholesale by frenzied armed white men. White boys as young as 10 years old, armed and unduly disrespectful of both law and person participated in all aspects of the brutality, mayhem, and horror that transpired. Incredibly, whites remained free to taunt and terrorize African Americans, invading their homes and plundering their possessions at will. The long arm of the law did not extend to these acts. The fate of African Americans systematically disarmed, rounded up, and deprived of their liberty, depended upon the kindness of their captors. This law enforcement, quote-unquote, strategy of neutralizing African Americans virtually assured the total decimation of the Black community. In practice, it left the Greenwood District defenseless and vulnerable and extended an open invitation to the thieves, arsonists, and killers who ran roughshod through the streets of Tulsa. Uh, That's page 46 and 47 of Black Wall Street from Ride to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District. Probably one of the best books dealing with the history of uh, Black Wall Street. And I know uh, Hannibal B. Johnson has a new book out dealing with the uh, uh, 100 years since the Tulsa race massacre, the 100th anniversary. So check that out as well. Okay, so a lot of people saw the documentary on the History Channel uh, on Sunday, uh, May 31st. Um, The uh, it's a two hour documentary, uh, Tulsa Burning, the 1921 Race Massacre, Tulsa Burning, the 1921 Race Massacre. Okay, and. This was uh, this came out. Yeah, this came out Sunday, Sunday, uh, May 30th, Sunday, May 30th. It was Sunday, May 30th. So I saw it three times 
and I recorded it. And I'm going back through watching it a fourth time and taking the note notes. I have five pages of notes so far. And I think I'm about, about a half hour into the show, into the documentary. So I, I wanted to talk some about Tulsa Burning, the 1921 Race Massacre documentary, and share some of my thoughts about that. Then we'll get into uh, Joe Biden. We'll talk a little bit about his speech today because I did an hour and 40 minute broadcast earlier today. So we'll talk a little bit about his speech and and, and talk about the policies that he laid out as well. He's the first uh, sitting American president to uh, visit Tulsa and to acknowledge the, the Tulsa race massacre. So it's, it was significant that he was there today. And a lot of what he said, uh, I would argue, was even more for the benefit of white people in America than African-Americans. Some of it was for our benefit, but uh, some of this we know. You still have white people who are just not learning about the Tulsa race massacre. OK, and there's been a debate over whether it was a massacre or a riot. And you had a lot of people who wanted to who wanted to uh, mitigate the severity of it by calling it a riot and not calling it a massacre. So uh, I think a lot of what uh, Biden said today was even more so for the benefit of many white Americans. And some of them had uh, relatives and ancestors who were involved in the Tulsa massacre or other uh, race riots and massacres uh, across the country uh, throughout history as well including the red summer 1919 when you had 25 major race rides uh across the country the red summer 1919 which was which was talked about in the um uh documentary uh Tulsa uh, uh Tulsa burning okay on on the history channel Tulsa burning the 1921 race massacre so we'll deal with that uh, on today's show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the me radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the comforts of his or her actions. Because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history, politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to sign up for our email newsletter. Uh, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can still register for the online course that I teach on um, Saturdays, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We do thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Kemet being one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So we do the class live on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions are recorded. So you can go back and watch it over and over again. If you miss anything, you can go back and watch it. You'll still have access to the course to watch it even after the course is over. Okay, so we're gonna post a link here. We have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the homepage. And as soon as you register, you can start watching the content. Uh, the class is 54% off right now. It's regularly $130, it's on sale $60. We're about halfway through the course. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. All right. Uh, let's jump into this uh, information here, okay? And also, if you um, want to support us, you can support us through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, uh, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Uh, I want to uh, talk about um, Tulsa burning 1921 race massacre. 
And if you have a question or comment, you can give us a call 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right. So the premise of the um of the documentary is uh is it now the documentary is executive produced by NBA superstar and philanthropist Russell Westbrook. And it is directed by Peabody and Emmy Award winning director Stanley Nelson, who also directed the documentary Freedom Writers and um, also Marco Williams, who uh, is a Peabody and DuPont Award winner who directed the documentary Two Towns of Jasper. Now, the uh, Tulsa burning the 1921 race massacre documentary commemorates the 100th anniversary of the horrific Tulsa race massacre of 1921. One of the worst acts of racial violence in American history and calls attention to the previously ignored but necessary repair of a town once devastated. The previously ignored but the previously ignored but necessary repair of a town once devastated. And this is something that's come up throughout the past few days. The need to repair the damage that was done, whether you call it reparations, whether you call it restitution or what have you, the need to repair the damage that was done. Some people say we shouldn't call it re uh, reparations, okay, because that automatically brings up a whole bunch of opposition. I totally understand that, all right? It's the same thing. It's the same thing when it comes to reparations with slavery. You don't have to call it reparations. You can call it something else. Whatever will allow us to get the bill passed in the House of Representatives and get 218 votes and get the bill passed in the Senate and get 60 votes. And it being that there are only 50 Republicans, it being that there are only 50 Democrats in the Senate, that means you're going to need 10 Republicans to vote for it. And I don't I can't even name five that will vote for uh, uh, reparations because. No, no Republicans in the Senate or the House voted for the American Rescue Plan, the one point nine trillion dollar American Rescue Plan, even though some of them are in their districts bragging about the benefits of the American Rescue Plan. The House helping out restaurants and businesses and different things like this, extending the federal unemployment insurance three hundred dollars a week, even though they're bragging about the benefits of it. None of them voted for it. So I don't know which Republicans going to vote for it. Reparation. Senator Tim Scott already said he's not voting for reparation. So I, I, I don't know which Republicans are going to do that. So uh, let, let me try to flip over here to the screen share. Okay, that won't that won't extend. it won't allow us to uh, increase the size of it. All right, increase the text. So this documentary deals with so much history. I, I was going through watching it again a fourth time today. And it deals with so much history. Uh, it deals with uh, Tulsa being Indian territory. It deals with the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And, and incidentally, May 28th was the anniversary of uh, President Andrew Jackson signing the Indian Removal Act of 1830 into law. That was May 28th, 1830. May 28th, 1830. Okay. Susie said, vote all of the Republicans out of office. OK, yeah, <laughs> especially if they supported the insurrection, especially if they voted not to certify the uh, uh, Electoral College votes. And especially if they especially if they voted not to have the uh, uh, January 6th uh, commission to investigate what happened, especially if they vote against that. Got to go. Got to go. All right. And, and also if they voted against the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, because you, you do realize I've talked about this before. I know we may have some new viewers. This ain't one of these other shows that you see uh, floating around. Uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed the House of Representatives March 3rd, 2021. 212 Republicans voted against the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. No Republicans voted for the bill. Go to, go to congress.gov and check H.R. 1280. That's the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Go to govtrack.us, check H.R. 1280. The one Republican that it shows voted for it, he put out a tweet saying he made a mistake and he was going to change his vote. No Republicans voted for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act 
after they cried about George Floyd being killed and how sad it is and, oh, he that shouldn't have happened, all that. None of them voted for the bill. So this is why I said, well, if you don't vote for us, we're not going to vote for you. We're going to vote you out of office. Don't stay home. Vote their asses out of office. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197. 313-645-4197 or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com that's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com you can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com bhistory101 at yahoo.com Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that'll satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted. Empower yourself. Start your free trial today. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, June 1st, 2021. We're halfway through the uh, the year already. This year is going by very quickly. And uh, we're live. We're talking about the documentary Tulsa Burning, the 1921 uh, race massacre. Tulsa Burning, the 1921 race massacre that aired uh, on the History Channel uh, Sunday, May 30th, 2021. And this is dealing with the 100th a commemoration of the Tulsa race massacre. And they gave a, a lot of history on it. They had some brilliant people they interviewed. They interviewed my man, uh, Hannibal B. Johnson, that wrote the book, Black Wall Street from Ride to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District. This is probably, probably the best book dealing with the history of Black Wall Street. And I know he has a new book out dealing with the 100th anniversary. I haven't read that one yet, but I've read this one. This book is deep. When I was doing my uh, I have a two and a half hour lecture that I've done dealing with the history of uh, Tulsa and Black Wall Street. This one here is available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Black Wall Street from destruction to the resurrection of economic empowerment. It's a two and a half hour lecture I did back in 2014. We have it on DVD and digital download at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Now, during the break. Uh, somebody said that they heard two versions of the story of how the race massacre started. One was that, um, uh, so you have Dick Rowland, 19 year old African American man, uh, dropped out of high school. He's a boot black. He's a shoe shine boy. He goes to the Drexel, um, the Drexel office building to the fourth floor to use the bathroom. You have segregation taking place in uh, Tulsa. OK, so he has to go to the Drexel building and use the bathroom. He goes on the elevator. Sarah Page is a 17 year old white female elevator operator. Um, and from the count that I've heard, uh, the, he went to go step on the elevator. The elevator wasn't level. He stumbles and reaches out to uh, he grabs Sarah Page's arm like to regain his balance. She screams. Some people hear it and they think 
he assaulted her. She says he didn't assault her. She tells the police that he didn't assault her. But, you know, the Tulsa uh, World newspaper puts out an article, Nab Negro Tonight, because there was already racial tensions brewing. There was already racial tensions brewing. This is two years after the Red Summer of 1919. But uh, in reading this book, and I read this back in 2014, in reading this book, uh, Hannibal B. Johnson talks about how the it was Dick Rowland's grandmother, I think it was. Um, he talks about how Dick Rowland and Sarah Page um, left left Tulsa together because Dick Rowland was never he was locked up. Um, at the sheriff's office, but Dick Rowland was never charged. He wasn't prosecuted. Okay, he he wasn't prosecuted. Hannibal B. Johnson talks says that um, Dick Rowland, I think it was his grandmother, said that he and Sarah Page left Tulsa together because they were lovers. And in watching the documentaries, it came out that the two were lovers. So. Yeah. So I, I I knew about this back in 2014. I just didn't talk about it a lot because I didn't hear a lot of corroborating information about it. I've talked to Hannibal B. Johnson with Facebook friends. I've talked about I've talked to him through Facebook and I, I want to set up an interview with him. But in, in these documentaries that have come out, it's come out that the two were lovers also. All right. So but it's a deep, deep history that that we deal with. But uh, I, I want to flip over here quickly we, we're dealing with a synopsis of um I, I want to do with the synopsis of the uh documentary okay so all right so we're doing with the uh, 100th anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre uh, one of the worst ra one of the worst acts of racial violence in American history. And this documentary calls attention to the previously ignored but necessary repair of a town once devastated. In the 1920s, the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, also known as Black Wall Street. Now, that was a moniker that um, Booker T. Washington uh, gave it Black Wall Street. OK, it's not what it was originally called. But that was a moniker Booker T. Washington gave it. And let me uh, blow this up a little bit here. All right. OK, so in the 1920s, uh, the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, also known as Black Wall Street, was one of the most prosperous African-American communities in the United States. Filled with booming businesses and thriving entrepreneurs, the district served as, as a mecca of black ingenuity and promise until the evening of May 31st, 1921, which marked the start of the devastating Tulsa massacre. More than 35 city blocks were burned to the ground and hundreds of uh, African-American city dwellers were killed. The Tulsa race massacre of 1921 is one of the most tragic, one of the most, one of the most tragic uh, moments in our nation's history. Yet this harrowing event is largely unknown to many Americans. That's why it was really good for Joe Biden to go there today because there's a whole lot of white people that, that don't know, still don't know, about the Tulsa massacre, it's just some African Americans don't know. To be honest with you, uh, and and a lot of them are saying because I was watching MSNBC this evening, and you had uh, one um, uh, Doctor uh, Jelani Cobb. Doctor Jelani Cobb was saying he was he's he's in Tulsa, and he's going around talking to people, and some of the white people were saying, uh, you know, couldn't believe it was that bad. They would they they thought people were exaggerating. It wasn't really that bad. Did they really kill three hundred people? They could, you know, they, they thought it was far fetched for three hundred, you know, largely African Americans to be killed. Well, you had close to according to Hamilton B. Johnson's book, uh, 
uh, page 46 and 47, you had about 15,000 white people that came through uh, Tulsa. Okay, North Tulsa. North Tulsa, where African Americans live. Okay. You had about 15,000 white people that came through. So, uh, and it's not far fetched. Now, when you now when you go study this history, it's not far fetched at all. Actually, it's an undercount. It's really believed to be an undercount of 300. So, the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921 is one of the most tragic moments in our nation's history. Yet, this harrowing event is largely unknown to many Americans. So, for a long time. In Tulsa, at least 50 years or so, the, the Tulsa World newspaper, which was the white newspaper, did not write about it. OK, did, did not write about it. And uh, it was a concerted effort not to teach about it in schools, uh, uh, things like this. OK, so it was a concerted effort to uh, suppress this information. It was a, a concerted effort to uh, uh, suppress this information. Let me. Uh, do this again. All right. Okay, let's go back to this here. And for a long time, you could not find any books on Black Wall Street. I, I remember the, the for a long time, the only book you could find, I think it was about Ronald Wallace. And it was a, a book that had a green cover and most of the information they had in there about Black Wall Street. It was a fictitious account. It was told like in a no like a novel, like a, um, you know, like a novel, a fictitious recounting of it. The first maybe two or three pages had some history and the rest of it was fictitious. That was the only book that we had for a long time on Black Wall Street. Now, it is often over and it is an often overlooked story that needs to be told. Tulsa burning the 1921 race massacre takes an in-depth, sobering look at the tragic events of a century ago and focuses on a specific period from the birth of Black Wall Street to its catastrophic downfall, from the birth of Black Wall Street to its catastrophic downfall over the course of two bloody days and finally, the fallout and reconstruction. OK, because as I said before, in, in researching um, the history of, of North Tulsa and, and Black Wall Street, the Greenwood District, the most the most uh, amazing thing that I found is that we rebuilt uh, Greenwood after the race massacre. We rebuilt it with our own dollars. We rebuilt Greenwood after the race massacre. And we rebuilt it with our own dollars. OK, it was a thriving. Um, we had a, it, it was thriving again, even in 1926. It was thriving again, even in 1926, when uh, Dr. W.B. Bois uh, went to Tulsa. It was thriving then. And he wrote about this. And then in the 1950s and 60s, it was a thriving community also. All right. So. Um, but what's going to happen is the expressways are going to come through and wipe out a lot of our businesses. Uh, homes are taken through eminent domain. A lot of the land that African-Americans used to own in North Tulsa is owned by the city of Tulsa now or the county. All right. So we have uh, the, the urban renewal or Negro removal that uh, did a job on us once again. Similar to what happened here in Detroit with uh, a, a black bottom in Paradise Valley and I-375 freeway, which comes to about, uh, about 1964, something like that. So uh, the, uh, it is an often overlooked story that needs to be told. Tulsa burning the 1921 race massacre takes an in-depth sobering look at the tragic events of a century ago and focuses on a specific period from the birth of Black Wall Street to its catastrophic downfall over the course of two bloody days, and finally the fallout and reconstruction. The documentary also follows the city's current day grave excavation, the current day grave excavation efforts at Oaklawn Cemetery, where numerous unmarked, unmarked coffins of victims who were killed and buried during the massacre have been recovered. 
It will also feature rare archival footage and imagery from the time coupled with commentary and interviews from numerous historians, city leaders, and activists, including the Tulsa Historic Society and Museum, the John Hope Franklin Center for Reconciliation. So John Hope Franklin is from Tulsa. The, the African-American historian John Hope, John Hope Franklin is from Tulsa, and his father was attorney B.C. Franklin. We talked about B.C. Franklin on yesterday's show, okay? Um, the Tulsa Race Massacre uh, Centennial Commission and the historic Vernon AME Church, among others. The historic Vernon AME Church is still there. This is a church where uh, many African-Americans went to for refuge to hide out from the white domestic terrorists, okay? And the church is still there. Now, it's in uh, 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 bad, it badly needs repairs, but that church is still there, Vernon AME Church. Okay, so I want to um, look at some of my notes here. And history.com has a good article uh, dealing with uh, North Tulsa and Black Wall Street. Uh, they have an article here dealing with the Tulsa massacre. So I'm going to pull that up and look at some of those pictures also here. Okay. Tulsa massacre from history.com. Pull that up. All right. So I want to look at my notes. Uh, they start out with uh, Reverend Robert Turner, who is the pastor there at the uh, Vernon AME Church, the historic Vernon AME Church that is uh, that is still there. OK. And he talks a little bit about the church history. Um, and he, he talks about the uh, finding out when he was going to become the pastor of the church and he visited the church for the first time. And they were telling him uh, he was looking at the cornerstone of the church. Uh, They're looking at the church. The cornerstone of the church said that the basement was erected in 1919. And he said, this is the same church, you know, that's been here all this time. And they said, yes, he said, well, he said, well, this church survived the 1921 race massacre. All right. This church survived the 1921 race massacre. Um, you have uh, some people who are, are descendants of um, some people who are descendants of survivors uh, who are interviewed uh, like uh, Brenda Nails Alford. Uh, Brenda Nails Alford, who is a descendant of uh, James and Henry Nails. OK, and she told a story of. When relatives would come to town, um, they would drive around uh, Greenwood, and when they go by Oakwood Cemetery, uh, somebody in the car would say, "You know, they're still there. You know, they're still there." They're talking about the bodies of African Americans who were killed uh, during the Tulsa Race Massacre. You know, they're still there. And, uh, you know, somebody in the car would say, yeah, yeah, we know. So you, you have an effort also to, they're, they're still looking for mass graves of, uh, of, of the victims. One of the things that we, we see here is that prior to 1907, Tulsa becomes a, uh, sorry, Oklahoma becomes a state in the union in 1907. Prior to 1907, it's Indian territory. So they basically don't have the Jim Crow laws prior to 1907. So African Americans are allowed to prosper more. Now, I, I was watching uh, MSNBC Today and Dr. Dana Ramey Berry was on, and I, I've interviewed her before. She's a historian. Uh, and she said that African Americans come into Tulsa in uh, somewhere around 1905, 1906, something like that. She said, "Okay, so I, I think this may be a common misconception. That's not true. I mean, they do come in, but African Americans were there before then because of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. You have African Americans being pushed off that land." 
in southeastern United States, okay, because of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, uh, Mus Muscogee Creek, Cherokee and Seminole Indians all owned uh, African slaves. So they're being pushed off their land in southeastern United States. And they all go on what's known as the Trail of Tears. Okay. They all go on the Trail of Tears and they go over a thousand miles uh, out west and they all go into Oklahoma. These uh, what are known as the five civilized tribes of Native Americans, they're going to take their African slaves with them. They're going to take their African slaves with them. May 20th, was May, May 28th. May 28th was the um, anniversary of the uh, signing of the Indian Removal Act of um, 1830, signed by President Andrew Jackson, okay? So to under really understand this history of Tulsa and how it came to be, because I hear people saying um, African, African Americans built Tulsa through self-determination. There was self-determination, but people leave out the fact that the early African American landowners in Tulsa got land because of the uh, of the of the uh, Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866, and the 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 slaves of the African slaves of these five civilized tribes of Native Americans were made citizens of those Native American nations. They were given land allotments. This was part of the treaties between these uh, Native American nations and the U.S. government. They had to free their slaves. Land allotment had to be given to them, et cetera. The first African-American landowners in Tulsa are going to get land from these treaties. This is before oil is discovered in Tulsa in 1905, because when oil is discovered, you have people coming from all over in the Tulsa. You have African-Americans, white people coming into Tulsa and their population swells. Their population grows. OK. This is before then. So. If we look at this here, uh, let me go over. I'm going to go over to this article here from uh, history.com. This is that white supremacist Andrew Jackson, who signed the Indian Removal Act in the law, uh, May 28, 1830. Now, there's another white supremacist who helped him carry this out. His name was Lewis Cash. You may have heard of him. That's the white supremacist who Cass Technical High School is named after. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you all familiar with this history. Cass Technical High School here in, in Detroit. Lewis Cass was uh, Andrew Jackson's secretary of state. And Lewis Cass helped to carry out the Indian Removal Act of 1830. One third of the people, uh, uh, one third of the people who were on the Trail of Tears were African people. He helped carry that out. And it's going to be thousands of people who die, including African-Americans. Lewis Cass, who Cass Technical High School is named after, he was the white supremacist who helped carry that out. I'm telling you that as somebody who graduated from Cass Technical High School. That's one of the reasons why they need to change the name of that damn school. Because people who respect themselves don't name their institutions after people who work to oppress their own people. That doesn't make sense. People who name their people who name institutions don't name it after their oppressors. They don't name it after people who work to carry out genocide against their own people. That's not logical. So let's continue. You see why they play the disclaimer during my show. But anyway, <laughs> let's continue. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Malcolm said, make it plain. You see Malcolm behind me. <laughs> All right. So let's continue here. Uh, then we'll go back to the article from uh, history.com. Where is that one? 
Let me close some of these tabs out. All right, here we go. Just a second here. I got to close some of these tabs out. All right, here we go. Trail of Tears. Okay, so at the beginning of the 1830s, at the beginning of the 1830s, uh, nearly 125,000 Native Americans lived on millions of acres of land. Lived on millions of acres of land in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, North Carolina, and Florida. Okay, uh, their ancestors had occupied and cultivated for generations. The U.S. wants this land. Okay, the U.S. wants this land. They're going to sign the Indian Removal Act of uh, uh, 1830 to push these Native American nations off their land. Uh, the U.S. wants this land to plant crops, plant cotton, different things like this. So they force them to go uh, out west on what's known as the Trail of Tears. All right, now. So oh, it deals with that history now. It, it, and then after the Civil War ends, because when the Civil War takes place, all five uh, civilized tribes and Native Americans fought, fought on behalf of the South because they wanted to uh, maintain slavery because they all owned slaves. They all fought on behalf of the South to maintain slavery. And if we look, go back and look at this article here from um, history.com and it's freezing up on me. So just bear with me some here. All right, it'll come back up. Okay, I'll come back to that in just a second. I'll come back to that in just a second here. Let me go back to my notes on the, on the documentary. So, um, between 1890 and 1900, as many as 100,000 African Americans migrated from the South to what is known as Indian Territory, going out West to Indian Territory. We were trying to get out of the South, trying to get away from the lynchings, trying to get away from domestic terrorism. We wanted to own land and we saw Indian Territory as a good opportunity to do this. And because this territory was not uh, this was um, territory of the United States, but it was not a state in the union yet. OK, so they didn't have the segregation laws out in Oklahoma yet. So it, it was a better opportunity for many African-Americans. Now, after Reconstruction, southern southern states started Reconstruction ends in 1877. After Reconstruction, uh, southern states start to implement uh, uh, Jim Crow laws to better to more regulate the uh, movement of African Americans. And then at the same time, you're going to have attack, uh, an attack on the voting rights of African American men also. Okay. You're going to have this take place as well. Uh, so from 1890 to 1900, as many as 100,000 um, African Americans migrated from the South to what is uh, known as Indian Territory. Now, southern states pass uh, the Black Code laws. They're going to start passing these laws after Reconstruction ends. The Union troops are removed out of the South. OK, the Union troops are removed out of the South. The Union troops were protecting the rights of African-Americans uh, to some extent. And we know that is going to be what's known as the Compromise of uh, 1877, the Compromise of 1877 that uh ends reconstruction okay it ends reconstruction and let me see here we have the uh if we go back and look at this article here it's loading up again from history.com uh in the southeastern united states many choctaw chickasaw seminole creek and and in cherokee uh, people embraced these customs and became known as the five civilized tribes of Native Americans. They embraced the ways of white of, of white people. They adopted Christianity. They learned to speak English. Uh, they adopted a European style of economic practice. 
okay uh, practices such as the individual ownership uh, and uh, individual ownership of land and other property, including in some instances in the South, and uh, they owned African slaves as well. They owned African slaves. So all see when you deal with Black Wall Street, and this is what I learned uh, a few years ago when I was doing my research. When you deal with the history of Black Wall Street, it ties into all this history. Okay, treaties, Native Americans. Uh, the uh, state of Oklahoma becoming a union. We're going to go to clip one quickly here, Shakita. Um, I want to get to this information here, Joe Biden. We'll continue this discussion tomorrow. Be sure to watch the one hour and 40 minute uh, broadcast that I did earlier today dealing with the um, dealing with the uh, uh, Biden speaking in uh, uh, Tulsa. Okay. Uh, I want to go to this clip here. This is from NBC Nightly News. This deals with uh, uh, Joe Biden speaking in uh, Tulsa and some of the policies that he laid out today. Let's go to this clip. In a remembrance and a reckoning, marking the 100th anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. I'm a Tulsa native. I've been here at the Remo Cultural Center for 25 years. Mr. Biden becoming the first president to visit Tulsa to commemorate the destruction of what was known as Black Wall Street. This was not a riot. This was a massacre. And for too long, forgotten by our history. The president tonight announcing new measures aimed at closing the racial wealth gap. Imagine all those hotels and dinners and mom and pop shops that could and have been passed down. Shockingly, the percentage of black American home ownership is lower today in America than when the Fair Housing Act was passed more than 50 years ago. Lower today. That's wrong. And we're committed to changing that. In the early 1900s, Tulsa's African-American district of Greenwood was successful and self-sufficient until the evening of May 31st, 1921 when a white mob descended on Greenwood, shooting and killing hundreds of black residents and burning thousands of homes and businesses. The massacre ended 48 hours later on June 1st, 1921. Ms. Viola Fletcher is among the three known living survivors. At 107 years old, she testified before Congress last month about the horror she experienced a century ago. I still smell smoke and see fire. I hear the screams. I have lived through the massacre every day. And President Biden met privately with Ms. Fletcher and the other two survivors, publicly thanking them for their courage. Okay, that's from uh, NBC Nightly News from June 1st, 2021. Uh, very quickly here, because uh, we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, we'll continue this on uh, tomorrow's show. But uh, read this article here from, uh, let's see, we've got one from uh, NBCnews.com. Uh, Biden calls on, uh, Biden calls on Americans to face dark side of history on 100th anniversary of Tulsa massacre. And uh, let's see, uh, Biden, now this is something very important. A, a lot of the speech uh, was for white people and they needed to hear it. Biden said, you can't just choose to learn what we want to know uh, you can't just choose to learn what we want to know and not what we should know you can't just choose to learn what we want to know not what we should know we should know the good the bad everything that's what great nations do they choose uh they choose to terms with their dark sides and we are a great nation the only way to build common ground is to truly repair and to rebuild, truly repair and to rebuild. I come here to help fill the silence because in silence, wounds deepen, okay? We're out of time here on 19 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Keep watching for a couple more minutes. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll keep broadcasting. Uh, right now, it's correct, wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Okay, uh, let's continue very quickly. So they, in this article, it talks about some of the policies 
that uh, he laid out. And I dealt with this extensively uh, early in my broadcast, so go watch that one. Uh, in conjunction with Biden's visit, the White House announced uh, Tuesday that the administration, they announced Tuesday, Okay, in conjunction with Biden's visit, the White House announced Tuesday that the administration was taking several steps aimed at narrowing the racial wealth gap, including an interagency effort to tackle racial discrimination in the housing market. Uh, the White House also said it will, quote, use federal government's purchasing power, use the federal government's purchasing power to grow federal contracting with small disadvantaged businesses by 50 percent, translating to an additional $100 billion over four years, an additional $100 billion over four years. Uh, the White House noted uh, several provisions of Biden's infrastructure and jobs plan that it said would help address the racial wealth gap, including tens of billions of dollars for community led redevelopment and transportation projects. Uh, the new steps uh, do not include a plan to address student uh, student loan debt. NAACP President uh, Derek Johnson was critical of that. Um, so we talked about that earlier. He says student loan debt uh, continues to suppress the economic prosperity of uh, black Americans across the nation. Um, even though he did say the, the what Biden laid out was needed, but he also said that student loan uh, student loan forgiveness is definitely uh, definitely needed as well. Okay, now there was a big article from uh, the Washington Post that dealt with this. Also, went more in depth than the one from uh, NBC News at Tulsa event. Biden announces uh, VP Harris will lead push for voting protections in response to states' recent ballot restrictions. Okay. It's from June 1st, 2021, um, Biden announced that he was tapping VP Harris to marshal an effort against the increasing array of Republican led uh, state laws that restrict voting in various ways. A campaign Biden condemned as un American. OK, uh, and this is a direct attack against these Republicans that are attacking us. And, and and you have 300, almost 400 uh, voter restriction bills in 47 state legislatures. OK, now. Uh, Biden said the sacred right is under assault with incredible intensity, like I've never seen. Uh, like like I've never seen uh, Biden said, adding that June should be a month of action. Uh, on Capitol Hill and taking what appeared to be a shot at Democratic senators, uh, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kristen Sinema of Arizona, suggesting they often side with Republicans. He said that. Yeah, because he said some of them, he said uh, a couple of them side with Republicans often. He's talking about them. They, they need to be voted out of office too. Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema uh, uh, of uh, West Virginia and Arizona respective, uh, respectively. Uh, yes, they're Democrats. Their asses need to be, they, they need to be voted out of office. They're pathetic. Um, the, so Biden has been under pressure to show more urgency in the face of a GOP push that indicates, uh, that includes efforts to overturn the last presidential election. Uh, Benedict Donald, fall, uh, Benedict Donald's false assertion that he won the last election, the big lie and Republican resistance to Democrats' voting rights proposals in Congress. Now, Democrats in Texas, over the weekend, and you saw my Facebook post about this, Democrats uh, in Texas over the weekend blocked a restrictive voting measure, at least temporarily, by walking out of the state house, denying Republicans a uh, quorum. And, and Texas has a whole history of, of, of racism. Texas was... Uh, Texas became a state in the union in 1845 as a slaveholding state. We know that the uh, 
Texas Rangers, the state, what is what, what are the state police now? But the Texas Rangers started as groups uh, as groups of bounty hunters that were hired by uh, slave owners in Texas to go into Mexico and capture runaway slaves. This is how the Texas Rangers started because Mexico is free territory. And, uh, you know, Texas won its independence from uh, Mexico in 1836. Uh, and then they became a state in the union in 1845. All right. Uh, and this is 1845. That's before the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. And then uh, the U.S. is going to get the territory that makes up Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Utah, and Nevada. They get all that in what's known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, they pay $15 million for that territory. But Mexico didn't want to sell the territory. All right. Mexico loses a third of their territory at the end of the Mexican-American War uh, in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. That's how all that territory becomes a U.S. territory, because the, the U.S. really wants to take over the entire North American continent. OK, they really want to take over the entire North American continent. All right. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle Her Hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustle Her Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface Tablet, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. So, And there was a post that I did. Um, There's a post that I did on Facebook uh, earlier today. They ran uh, Hannibal B. Johnson was interviewed on uh, MSNBC and they ran this story and they said that. Uh, let me pull this up here. Yeah, we can, sh I can show this to you. They said on June 1st, 1921, um, this is what the Tulsa World newspaper, uh, what, what, this is what the headline was. Tulsa World, New, Tulsa World newspaper is the white-owned newspaper there in Tulsa. The headline was Two Whites Dead and Race Riot. They're talking about the Tulsa Race Massacre. This was the headline. Two Whites Dead and Race Riot. Three local guard units out. Race war wages for hours after outbreak at courthouse. Troops and armed men patrolling streets. But they focus on two white people dead. This is this is from June 1st, 1921. That was their focus. Two white people dead. Now, this is a comparison between 
the Tulsa World newspaper headline June 1st, 1921, and the Tulsa World newspaper headline June 1st, 2021. Mayor apologizes for massacre. Mayor apologizes for massacre. That's the headline today. A hundred years ago, the same newspaper, the headline was two whites dead in race riot. This is Hannibal B. Johnson, uh, who wrote uh, the book here, one of the best books dealing with the history of uh, Black Wall Street. He was interviewed by Jeff Bennett today on, on MSNBC. Black Wall Street from Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's historic Greenwood District. OK, he was interviewed by Jeff Bennett today. Uh, Hannibal B. Johnson was also in the documentary on the History Channel and the one on PBS uh, that aired Sunday, I think it was, and the one on CNN as well. He's in all of those. Then uh, let me see here. Okay, Hannibal B. Johnson, Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Committee. There's another picture there. These are African Americans fleeing uh, the race massacre. Okay. All right. So uh, I, I posted about that earlier today also. Now, what's interesting is that Mayor G.T. Bynum, who issued the apology, who, who uh, issued the, um, what was it, the uh, apology, um, Mayor G.T. G. Bynum, his family owned 931 slaves collectively. His family owned 931 slaves. Now, he's against reparations, but his family owned 931 slaves. Hmm. Okay. He reminds me of Moscow Mitch McConnell, who's against reparations also. And McConnell, um, I think it was his great-grandfather or something like that, uh, two, two of his relatives owned 14 slaves collectively. Only two other slaves were men. The other 12 were women. Not sure what that was about, but I, I just find that interesting. Okay, let's continue here. So, uh, I want to go back to the article from the Washington Post. Okay, so Democrats in Texas over the weekend blocked a restrictive voting measure, at least temporarily, by walking out of the state house. Uh, Biden is the first president to visit uh, Tulsa to commemorate the 1921 massacre, which included numerous atrocities and destroyed a proper black community. Uh, he delivered a searing speech that recounted the events in great detail and sought to, quote, feel the silence about the killing, feel the silence about the killing. Now, in the broadcast I did earlier today, I talked about the proclamation that Biden issued on May 31st, 2021, uh, declaring uh, May 31st a day of remembrance uh, for the Tulsa race massacre. You can uh, you can go watch the hour and 40 minute broadcast I did earlier today. It's here on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, on my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. You can read the proclamation. Um, uh, at whitehouse.gov, a proclamation of, of, on day of remembrance, 100 years after the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. OK, so you can read the full thing. And he 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 goes through and he talks about uh, dealing with systemic racism. He talks about the need for uh, uh, America to address this. And I forgot exactly how he put it. It was in. Oh, well, paragraph one, the last sentence in paragraph one, because I have it printed up here and I made notes. Uh, I call on the American people to reflect on the deep roots of racial terror in our nation and recommit to the work of rooting out systemic racism across our country. That's uh, paragraph one. Then community growing. I'm just going to give you the highlights of this because I have a, a bunch of notes here. Uh, do, 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 paragraph five. He 
He talks about uh, the aftermath of the attack. Local ordinances were passed requiring new construction standards that were prohibitively expensive, meaning many African-American families could not rebuild in, in North Tulsa and Greenwood. Later, Greenwood was redlined by mortgage companies and deemed hazardous by the federal government so that African-American homeowners could not access uh, could not access home loans or credit on equal terms. So you're dealing with systemic racism coming from the federal government. And in later decades, federal investment, including federal highway construction, tore down and cut off parts of the community. The attack on uh, black wealth in Greenwood persisted across generations, all right? He goes on to say the federal government must reckon with and acknowledge the role that it has played in stripping wealth and opportunity from black communities. The federal government must reckon with and acknowledge the role that it has played in stripping wealth and opportunity from black communities. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to uh, acknowledging the role federal policy played in Greenwood and other black communities and addressing longstanding racial inequities through historic investments in the economic security for children and families, programs to provide capital for small businesses in economic, economically disadvantaged areas, including minority-owned businesses, and ensuring the infrastructure projects increase opportunity, uh, advance racial equity and environmental justice, and promote affordable access. You can read the rest of this. The, but that relates to policies that Biden laid out today in Tulsa. Read the full uh, proclamation here at whitehouse.gov, a proclamation on day of remembrance 100 years after the 1921 uh, race massacre. All right, now, uh, let's see here. We got that. Go back to Washington Post. Go back to Washington Post. Okay. And I went in depth into all this in my broadcast earlier today. The massacre was killed 300 and okay, 1,250 homes destroyed. There's about 1,256 homes that were destroyed. Okay, uh, in the speech today, Biden said for much too long, the history of what took place here was told in silence, cloaked in darkness. But just because history is silent, it doesn't mean that it did not take place. Then they get into Oklahoma Governor Joe Titus. Oklahoma Governor uh, Kevin Stitt, Republican, who just signed in the law bill banning critical race theory in the state of Oklahoma. He also signed the he also signed in the law a bill that absolves drivers of any responsibility if they run over or injure or kill uh, protesters at a rally uh, because the drivers say that they fear for their lives. That's the same Governor Kevin Stitt, a uh, Trump supporter. Uh, he drove to Tulsa with his wife, Sarah, to greet Joe Biden. Sarah Stitt had enlisted the museum of the Bible to help uh, Vernon AME Church preserve its book of redemption, a ledger of black families who contributed to rebuilding Greenwood after the 1921 destruction. The newly restored artifact was unveiled Monday. Uh, the governor's relations with black organizers in Tulsa's in Tulsa is strained. Uh, governor Kevin Stitt was booted from a commission on the massacre last month after signing legislation that critics say promoted opposition to the teaching of critical race theory, the intellectual movement to examine the ways policies and laws perpetuate systemic racism. Uh, Governor Kevin Stitt said the legislation was politicized and that he's long supported teaching the hard parts of Oklahoma history. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you said that, but you, you, but what happens is, is that you're putting limitations on what they could teach about racism and you, uh, you're banning uh, the teaching of critical race theory as well. It's causing confusion for teachers in Oklahoma also. Now, let me see something here.
Um, okay, this is the voter restriction. I mean, the, uh, the voting rights bill. Okay, read read the rest of this here. Okay, read the rest of this. Uh, at Tulsa event, Biden announces Harris uh, will lead push for voting protections in response to state's recent ballot restrictions. The article from... The article from Axios lays out what's in what Biden unveiled today better. Biden unveils plan to combat racial wealth gap on anniversary of Tulsa massacre. It's from June 1st, 2021. Read this article from Axios.com. It lays out um, uh, the policies that Biden laid out. Uh, it, lays, it lays that out better today. Okay, we have to get out of here. Hey, if you uh, like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. When you do it through... Um, Cash app, be sure to type in dollar sign the A H N show S H O W. Type in all the characters. Dollar sign the A H N show S H O W. This helps us to keep broadcasting six days a week, uh, do the research, stay on the air, pay some of the bills, etc. Register for the online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a nine-week online course. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I do the class live. All the sessions are recorded as well. You can go back and watch them over and over again. You go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, we have the information right on the home page. Uh, scroll down. You'll see the information about our daily radio show and how to listen to podcasts. Scroll down. Click right here to register. Takes you to the next page. Uh, click right here to enroll. The class right now is 54% off. It's regularly $130 on so $60. You'll still have access to watch the course even after the course is over. So as soon as you register, you can start watching content. You can start watching uh, the class we did this past Saturday. I'll be in Atlanta uh, Friday, June 18th through Sunday, June 20th for the Juneteenth, uh, the, the Juneteenth uh, Atlanta Parade and Music Festival. Visit JuneteenthATL.com for more information. We're going to put this on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. Visit Juneteenth, um, JuneteenthATL.com for more information. It's at Centennial Olympic Park. Friday, June 18th through uh, Sunday, June 20th. It's free and open to the public. Um, the uh, They have the event times here as well. Uh, I'll have a vendor booth there. I'll be speaking Saturday and Sunday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. at um, the amphitheater. I'll be speaking Saturday, Saturday and Sunday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the amphitheater at Centennial Park for the ninth annual Juneteenth Atlanta Parade and Music Festival. They're going to have uh, presenters. They have about 100 to 130 African-American, Caribbean, and African vendors. Uh, I'll be speaking there as well. They'll have a cult a cultural arts, uh, 5K freedom run, uh, yoga, martial, art, martial arts, meditation, Father's Day weekend uh, celebration. They have the Black History Parade that takes place, Black History Parade in March for um uh for juneteenth all this taking place okay all right so check that out all right we have to get out of here remember the african history network we focus on educating empowering and inspiring people of african descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior 
Uh, it's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace.